after a restoration of almost six years. The tallest church tower in the Netherlands is visible again in all its glory since the beginning of November 2024. What did the church look like before the nave collapsed in 1674? Why is this church notorious for a homosexuality? And what do Louis XIV, William of Orange and Desiridius Erasmus have to do with it? Follow us and discover the fascinating history of one of the Netherlands' most striking buildings. The Dom Tower. For over 650 years, the pride of the city of Utrecht has kept an eye on traders, shoppers, schoolchildren, and all the other thousands of residents who stroll past the church every day. This tower has become so iconic for the Dutch that they often do not even know that the original name of the church is not Don Church, but St. Martin's Cathedral. Its history begins on April 29, 1253, when a fire damaged the Roman predecessor of the church and destroyed its tower and a large part of the city centre. At a time when governments barely existed and certainly did not help financially in the event of natural disasters, Pope Clement IV allowed money to be raised from 1265 onwards. He did this by allowing the sale of indulgences, which is a document in which the bishop declares that a person should be forgiven of his sins. Money flowed in soon from people who wanted to quickly buy off their sins. So you could say that St. Martin's Cathedral was built from the sins of Catholics in the wide area surrounding the church. Soon after enough money was raised, with the help of the clergyman Jan van Nassau, the majestic project to give the Netherlands its own cathedral began with the construction of the ambulatory, which was finished in 1295. Immediately after this was completed, the southern and northern choir aisles were built, which were completed in 1320 and 1350, and in 1321, construction also began on the most famous part of the church, the tower. Many cathedrals have two towers at the entrance, but due to a lack of space to the west of the church, it was decided to give the church a law by instead building the highest church tower in the entire Low Countries. According to urban legend, the first architect, Jan van den Dom, built the tower because during his birth his mother had a vision of a tower so high that the top disappeared into the sky. However, the construction of the tower led to strong criticism at a time when all faiths looked at each other with envy. Few people know that because of this, that also before the collapse of the nave, the Dom Tower and church were never one whole. On Dom Square, under the statue of William of Orange's brother Jan. Anyone who wants to know why this was can find a map of a church in the street pattern. This is no coincidence, because in the 13th century, the St. Salvator Church stood on that exact spot. The Solvator community had several properties north of the Dompline, and after a long struggle, it was agreed that a passage would be left between the tower and St. Martin's Cathedral so that the Solvator clergy could easily walk back and forth. The tower and church would remain separated forever, except for an 11-metre high footbridge between the bishop's private lodge in the Dom Tower and the church. and the construction of such a majestic building led to more resistance in a time when many parents could not even feed their children. More than 125 years before Martin Luther kicked off the Reformation, 
Utrecht preacher, Gerard Groot wrote a fierce critique of the expensive Dom Tower. He and his followers, who preached simplicity in the Catholic Church, saw the tower as a second Tower of Babel, a symbol of waste meant only to please vanity. But although it is difficult for us to understand, the people of Utrecht chose stones over bread and continued to build. It took no less than 60 years to build the tower, but in 1382, the pride of Utrecht stood proudly upright with an unparalleled height of 112 meters. These days, we like to pat ourselves on the back for our modern architectural wonders. But you immediately realize how skilled these medieval builders were when you know that it was not until the 1960s that the Dutch were able to build buildings higher than this tower. As the church was further embellished, St. Martin's Cathedral became an increasingly important and well-known church. Exactly 10 years after the church tower was completed, one of the most famous Dutch people of all time appeared here, because none other than Desiridius Erasmus was ordained a priest here on the 14th of April 1392. But the work was not yet completed, and in 1505 bell founder Gert van Woo installed 13 bells, together weighing more than 30,000 kilos, of which seven can still be found in the bell tower, in addition to six replacements. Utrecht completed its magnum opus in 1521, after almost 300 years of fundraising and building. St. Martin's Cathedral was finished, and a golden age would dawn for the magnificent church. In 1579, the Union of Utrecht was signed here in the church, which is seen as the precursor of the first Dutch constitution. This also shows that the city of Utrecht had become a prosperous centre in the Netherlands. But the Union was also a sign that great changes were coming. It meant a stronger United Netherlands, which resisted Spanish Catholic rule, and those Netherlands became increasingly Protestant. Martin Luther's voice was heard, and in 1566 the Bilden storm swept through the Netherlands, in which lavish images of Catholic saints were destroyed by Protestants. At first, St. Martin's Cathedral escaped, but the traces of a second rebellion in 1580 can still be seen in the church today, and since then, its decoration is very sober. In 1581, the church became Protestant, although in 1672, it briefly fell into Catholic hands again, when none other than the Frenchman Louis XIV conquered Utrecht. But less than a year later, the French withdrew and the church became Protestant again. Yet it was not that year, but one year later that became the year that all Utrecht residents remember to this day. On August 1st, 1674, a storm raged across the Netherlands and it caused large parts of the church to collapse. It's a miracle that the tower remains standing and recent scientific research shows that is because it was not a tornado that raged around the church, but a so-called downburst. A downburst sometimes occurs when cold wind is pushed away from a rain cloud, creating a very localized wind blowing hundreds of kilometers per hour that is barely noticeable a few meters away. This caused the nave of the dome to take a beating while the tower endured much lighter gusts of wind and survived. You can imagine that the impact of the collapse on the community was significant. Some saw the collapse as a punishment from God for the godlessness of the past years, and there was never enough money to rebuild the nave. 
In the 150 years that followed, the ruins served as a cemetery, but also became a notorious game-eating place. And if you think that homosexuality was allowed in liberal Holland, you're wrong. In 1730, right here in the Michaels Chapel of the Tower, to homosexuals were caught by the sexton. This led to a large-scale persecution of homosexuals, with 40 men being persecuted, and even 18 being killed. Since then, coming from behind the dam has become an expression for a homosexuality in Dutch. A Utrechtenaar is a nickname for a homosexual. Since 1999, a monument in memory of these horrific persecutions has been erected in the middle of the Dom Square. With this terrible story, we're almost at the end of the history of this beautiful church. In the past 700 years, William of Orange has walked around here. First the Spanish, and later the French armies of Louis XIV were supplanted. After the storm, the tower remained standing in the First World War and saw the light planes flying towards Berlin in the second. These stones have seen more than you and I could ever experience in a lifetime. Let's hope they can witness history for another 700 years. But we don't leave without answering what happened with the ruins of the nave after the storm. They were not cleared until 1826, and 10 years later some even considered to demolish the tower. Fortunately, that never happened, and in recent years, there have even been increasing calls for the nave to be rebuilt. So maybe, if you're young, one day, you'll witness St. Martin's Cathedral shining again in all its glory. Thanks for watching and see you again in one of our next videos.